here with us this evening. We're in the book of Matthew. We're in the 27th chapter, although we're trying to look at the other uh, gospel accounts also as we talk about the crucifixion of Christ. There were several things we'd mentioned about this. We, we'd gotten introduced uh, to it, some of the things that he had suffered. Uh, we talked about, uh, in, in his suffering, we talked about the uh, beating they'd received, the uh, scourging from the Romans, uh, sometimes referred to as a Roman half-death. Uh, we talked about the beginning of crucifixion, uh, of how that he is uh, having his hands nailed to the cross, not going through the palms as we normally think about it, but into the wrist area between the two bones there to impel him upon that cross. Uh, but one thing I, I failed to mention last time is what we have here, the, this idea of, of the bloody sweat. The, the word that's used there, the medical term for it, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, hemodidrosis, uh, a bloody sweat. Uh, and the doctor who was writing about this says that for a long time period, had, a long time of period, people had tried to uh, deny this for whatever reason, uh, because primarily many of them thought that something like this just never happened. But he said they could have checked with uh, some of the uh, material that's available and learned that though it is an uncommon thing, it is something that has happened several times and there are records of it. And the idea of it is, is that when an individual is under a lot of stress in life, uh, that, the, that such can be so stressful to them that the, uh, the little capillaries that... Uh, we have all over our face, well, throughout the body, but especially on the face, but also in the sweat glands, uh, that, that those capillaries under stress can burst. And as, as a cause of that, both the blood and the sweat would come out at the same time. Uh, and, and that's what's happening here to Christ. Anyhow, the doctor who talked about that, as he talks about the crucifixion of Christ, pointed out here in regard to this that it's something he says... Uh, could produce marked weakness and possible shock within an individual that undergoes through that. Uh, we know that on the occasion that this happens, and by the way, uh, who, who's the only one of the uh, gospel writers that talks about this? Luke. You think there's anything significant about that? Yeah, because he's the doctor, uh, and he's the only one that talks about it, that mentions this happening to Christ. And I'm sure you know that to him as a doctor it would have been uh, something of greater interest to know what had happened. And at the time that that happened is the time that, uh, that angels came and ministered to Christ. Uh, maybe because of this stress that's caused to that, that could produce shock and other things, that, that he receives this help from God through these angels uh, to help him endure through that and the things that are coming. Uh, and so I just want to go back and just mention that. Now, the crucifixion we talked about initially about some of the things that happened to him, you know, the, the uh, crucifixion there had been nailed to that cross through the hands and all, but also through the feet. And uh, normally when, when we talk about this, uh, this doctor, let me just read how he expresses how this would have been done, uh, but then I, I want to move from that to, uh, to something I think that uh, is a little bit different from the way he portrays it, just simply because of some of the information we have available to us today. Uh, he says of this, of this, the left foot, he says, is pressed backward against the right foot with both feet extended, toes down. A heavy nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in the wrist, excruciating fiery pain shoots from the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves. As he pushes himself upward to avoid this stretching torment, he places his full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, there's the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the metatarsal bones of the feet. Uh, that's the way he describes it, and that's the way that, that most people have understood the crucifixion of Christ with those nails being through his wrist and through the feet, one on top of another. Uh, for a long time, uh, we didn't have any description as to how crucifixion was carried out. And there was absolutely no evidence from archaeology as to it until 1968. In, in 1968, uh, archaeologists discovered, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Oshery. Uh, I have a picture of what that looks like here. It, it's, it's a box in which the bones of a person that's died are placed for burial. 
Uh, anyhow, they found this one. This is not the particular one. I just found a picture to show you what it looked like. But it was a man by the name of Jehochanan. Uh, he had been uh, crucified. And evidently when he was crucified, when, when, when his feet were nailed to the cross, uh, it wasn't one foot on top of another, but the nail was placed through the ankle of one foot into the post in which he was crucified, and another nail through the ankle of the other foot into that post. And one of the, the nails, when it was driven through, hit a, evidently hit a knot, and it bent the end of the nail. So when it was taken down from the cross, it, it, it could not easily be extracted, and so they had to really cut out part of the wood with the ankle. And so that was found in this burial box. Uh, there's the nail, you can see that's being a one end, and this is the ankle bone here where it came through, uh, impelling it. So evidently, when they were impaled upon the cross, this is what they did. Uh, an image of it, of something that would have been like this, maybe, as to how he was crucified. Now, uh, what difference does it make? Well, I don't guess it makes a great deal of difference, but I do remember reading how some people try to explain the empty tomb, you know, and they talk about how that, uh, that Jesus, you know, simply passed out on the cross and they thought he was dead, so they took him down and buried him. And then in the coolness of the tomb, he's revived and, and he gets up. Uh, but just think, you know, if a person has been crucified in this way, not only do they have him coming out of the tomb after he revives, moving that stone out of the way, overcoming the guards that are there uh, to prevent his escape, uh, but then walking for several miles uh, to, to get to where his disciples to meet him in Galilee, uh, going from Jerusalem then up to Galilee, and walking on feet where the ankles would have been broken uh, by something like this. So, you know, just understanding this precludes the idea that, that some people have put forth that Jesus didn't really die. He only passed out, then he revived, and then all this other happened. Uh, just, uh, I think in, in demanding something like that, they're demanding something that's just a greater miracle uh, as the resurrection itself, that the man could endure all of that and then still do what they claimed he had to do. So anyhow, uh, the, the way he's crucified here on it. Now, the pain that goes with all of this is, is just hard for us to imagine. Uh, I don't know that anyone would know what it's like to have something driven like that, driven through your ankles, breaking them and impelling you to the cross, or having those great spikes driven through your wrist, or to have been beaten unmercifully, uh, unmerciful as he was, and, and the scourging. Uh, we never would have been understood that. But the next thing we do understand, uh, because that doctor talks about the excruciating cramps that began here uh, with Jesus. He says at this point another phenomenon occurred as the arms fatigue, great waves of cramps come over the muscles, uh, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed, and the intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fails to raise himself in order, or fights to raise himself in order to get even one short breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring the life-giving oxygen. It was undoubtedly during these periods, he says, that Jesus spoke the seven words from the cross. So here's something, though, that I think most all of us have experienced at some time or another, uh, muscle cramps. Uh, first thing I knew anything about muscle cramps, uh, I, I remember it happened to my sister. Of all things, her big toe cramped up, and that thing started curling under her foot, and she was screaming like mad. And I thought, what in the world? You know, I mean, so your toe's bending in other words. That, it, it can't hurt that bad. I never experienced any cramps. Didn't know anything about it. But uh, mine come usually when I wake up at night, and, and it's usually in the calf of my leg. And, you know, you've got to get up, and you've got to stretch it. And you see that all the time in football games when people have those leg cramps and they, they get them laying down on their back, put the leg up and push that foot back as far as they can, stretching that muscle to help relieve the cramps in it. Well, I've experienced those several times and know something about that. But Jesus is in a situation where there's nothing he can do physically to try to relieve that. There's no way he can, can stretch his legs out in, in that position that he's in to do that. 
Uh, and so this is another thing that he has to endure as far as the physical pain is involved in the cross, uh, the cramps that are going through there. Uh, and there's that hour. I mean, he, he, can, he can push himself up, you know, after he's, he's sacked down and the weight's all in his nail, on, nails in his hand, you know, and, and as then as he talks about here, this doc talks about the carbon dioxide builds up, that kind of eases the pain of the cramps. But then he can't breathe out. So what he's got to do then is put all that weight through those nails through his feet and push upward so he can breathe out. But then that starts the cramps coming again too. So it's not just a one-time thing. It's something that's going to be going on here with him in this. And also just think about that continual. Uh, in order to breathe in and out, continually got to raise up on that cross, putting the weight on the nails through his feet, then sagging down, and the weight comes on the nails through your wrist. Uh, and as he's moving up and down on that cross, just think about, you know, he's been beaten uh, with a scourging. But now, by now, this time, maybe that blood has dried up. He's been to clot there on his back. But every time he goes up and down on that rough uh, part of the cross there, it's opening up those wounds again. And sometimes the pain can be just as severe then as it was when it was first inflicted. Uh, when I lived in, in Tennessee, one of the men that led singing for us uh, Brother Baxter told about the time that he had had sinus surgery. And when he got through the surgery, you know, they packed your sinus real good and had these little tubes up in the air and packed, and he had to keep it that way for a few days. And he went back to the doctor. Uh, and he's in the office there, and the nurse comes in, and, uh, you know, for a few minutes there working with him. Then she leaves, and the doctor comes in. And the doctor says, uh, well, just kind of tilt your head back up and look at the light. And he did, and the doctor reached up there with these little pliers and yanked it out, and he said there was a pain that shot up to his head, and the next thing he knew, they're slapping his face trying to get him to revive, laying out on that table. And the doctor is really nervous and upset, and he said, did the nurse not give you that shot? And he said, no, she didn't. Well, I thought about, you know, the way the pain he described, he said that was much worse than when he had the surgery, and he had to go up there and clear all that out that that was even worse. Well, I think that's the way it is with Christ on the cross. The beating that he had was a horrible thing. Like I said, the Roman half death, and yet, as he's on the cross and constantly having to be moving up and down to breathe, it's constantly opening up those wounds again uh, and, and just producing more and more pain. But then this doctor says, after all of that, going on for you know nearly six hours there on the cross as this has happened, he says, then another agony begins. A deep, crushing pain deep in the chest as the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. Uh, and so this is the pain that he's expressed. Is that card, uh, the, uh, what do what I call it again now here, the uh, pericardium? It's that sac that, that's around the heart. And when it begins to fill with serum, this fluid, it's putting pressure on the heart. And, and I don't know, but I guess maybe that's like a person having a severe heart attack. Uh, and those that I've known that had it have described that as being some of the worst pain they'd ever had in life. And that's what he's going through here with that being pressure being put onto his heart like that, uh, that's brought about upon him. Uh, and this doctor says, let us remember again the 22nd Psalm, the 14th verse, which says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. So that idea maybe of that uh, pressure being put on the heart, uh, compressing it like this, it causes all of this pain. And then a a after this, he says, it's almost over. Uh, that is, his life is almost over. Uh, and he explains, he says, the loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs, he says, are making a frantic effort to gasp in, grasp in small gulps of air, the markedly dehydrated tissues send their flood of stimuli to the brain. Uh, and so there's this pain that's brought on constantly. And he said it's during this time maybe that, that he spoke uh, the last two or three times that he would speak from the cross. Uh, then he goes on and he, and, he, and he says, Apparently, to make doubly sure of death, the legionnaire, drives his, his lance, the spear, up through the ribs of Christ into the heart itself. 
And, and the text, when it talks about it, says in the 34th verse, the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, says that, that blood and water came out together. He said the water is that, that probably the, the fluid there in the pericardium, that he it says it's, it's, it's clear, like water. It's not water, but it's clear like that it comes out. And the fact that there's blood in it, he says, would indicate that the heart itself had been pierced. And, and so that's what this blood is coming from. And as he expresses it, he says that this gives to us a conclusive post-mortem evidence that our Lord dies at that time. Not the usual crucifixion, death, or suffocation, but of heart failure due to shock and constriction of the heart by fluid in the pericardium. Uh, and so, you know, <clears throat> the agony that he's going through for six hours. Uh, and, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question, why would anyone be willing to do that? Now, we're going to talk about some reasons a little bit later here about that, but when you think about it, uh, you'd say nobody would volunteer to go through something like that. But Jesus did. Uh, he had experienced, I'm sure, seeing other people crucified because the Romans crucified thousands of Jews, uh, and he knows what it's going to be like. And yet he accepts that because that's the will of his Father, because he knows this is the only way that mankind can be saved. And so... You and I are here tonight in the situation we are, redeemed from sin, not because we by our power are able to provide for that, but because Jesus was willing to endure all of this suffering and pain for us in order that we might be redeemed. Now, if that was all that Jesus had to go through, you know, that, that's something that I think most of us would never want to have to endure. But there was so much more to the crucifixion than just the physical pain that Jesus is going through. Uh, Crucifixion was also a shameful death. <clears throat> now, we've talked about this before, I think, at different times, but uh, crucifixion was something reserved uh, for the worst of criminals. Uh, first of all, no Roman citizen would be put to death by crucifixion uh, because it's such a horrible death and because it's such a shameful death. Only the wicked, most wicked of the wicked, you know, uh, would deserve crucifixion. And so you think about this and what that must have meant for, for Jesus and for his family, for his disciples, uh, to be put to death in that way. Uh, every one of us has experienced the loss of someone that we love to death. Uh, that, that in itself is, is a horrible thing to have to go through. It's a, a time of, of great sadness. And yet when it happens, usually we have friends around us who who love us and care for us, and they do what they can to offer comfort to us during that time. Uh, but what if that loved one was executed by the government because he had been deemed by some and convicted by some to be guilty of some heinous crime? Uh, then, you know, the shame that that causes to a family. And, and usually when something like that happens, you don't always have a lot of people getting around to comfort you in your sorrow. But that's what Jesus is enduring. He's enduring death as a criminal. And, and when he's crucified, he's crucified near a roadway that's coming out of Jerusalem. And so there would be a number of people, and the Bible talks about this, passing by that would see him. And all they see is, is the sign above his head and the accusation against him that he claims to be king of the Jews. Uh, and so he's being put to death. Now, to Rome, if he really were king of the Jews, uh, they would see that as being someone who's in rebellion to Rome, not accepting Caesar as king. And so he's, he's put to death in that way, and, and the shame that, that would cause to the family. But there's something else about it. Uh, normally, when a person was crucified, they were stripped completely naked and crucified in that way. But the Jews were given special leniency in that regard. Uh, whenever a Jew was put to death, uh, he would have a loincloth on. But, you know, you think about that as far as, as, as the Roman people uh, and, and the Jews and the difference in their cultures. And all, to the Jewish people, you know, the, there, there was a great modesty as to how they dressed and the people of that area. Uh, and in the Old Testament, we have examples of when uh, other nations had captured Jews and they wanted to shame them. You know, they might cut off their beard, uh, you know, just cut it off flat across that. 
And it had that reason why that would be a shame to the Jews because that was associated many times with those who worshipped idols. But not only that, but they would cut off their garments uh, and send them out that way. And, and that was a tremendous shame to the Jews to be like that. And so for a person, even with the loincloth, you know, that, that would have been such an immodest thing for the Jews. It would have been a very shameful thing for them to be exposed in public like that. And yet, again, that's what Jesus has been willing to accept, you know, uh, that type of death being suffered there because of his love for mankind and his desire for us uh, to be saved. So with all of that going on, with the suffering, with the shame that's attached to it, why in the world would Jesus choose to die? And, and as we em emphasized before, he did make that choice himself in doing that. Someone turn to John chapter 10 and, and read verses 17 and 18 for us. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Okay, when Jesus is crucified, it's not because he lacked the power to save himself. You know, there were those there at the cross mocking him and saying, if you're the Christ, do what? Save yourself. You know, come down from the cross and we'll believe. But he didn't do that. So the Jews would look at that and say, All right, you know, this is evidence he's not the Son of God as he claims because he doesn't have the power to come down off of that cross. And that's why he's hanging there. No, that's not the reason why he's hanging there. It's not because he lacks the power to come down. It's not because he's actually guilty of sin and, and is deserving of death, and that's why he's there on that cross. That's not the reason why. Uh, there were several reasons given in the Bible as to why Jesus died. We've talked about this a lot in the most recent lesson I preached here. We talked about some of this. Number one, he died to remove the law of Moses. And that was extremely important. Because we talked about before, under the old law, what could the law do for you if you sinned? Yeah, it condemned you. The sins, we talked about sins rolling forward. Those sins would be remembered every year. They were never forgiven under that old law. Now, the law could condemn you for the sins that you committed, but the old law could not really remove those sins. And, and so <clears throat> when Jesus came, one of the reasons he came was to remove that law. And, and the passage I talked about before, you know, was when Peter talked about that in Acts 15. And, and Peter said to those Pharisees who had become Christians and wanted to bind the law upon the Gentiles, saying they've got to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. And Peter says, Why are you putting a yoke upon them that neither our fathers nor we were able to keep? You know, you're, you're putting a burden on them that's impossible to keep. <clears throat> none of them, none of our fathers, and Peter says, and we ourselves, none of us have been able to keep that law perfectly so that we would be saved and not condemned. And so, uh, uh, you know, if we lived under that law, and that's the only law we ever had, we would not be able to be saved from our sins because that law could only condemn, it could not provide for our salvation. Another passage I want to look at, if you'll turn now to Hebrews chapter 8, uh, verses 7 and 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. Who's got that for us? You have that, Darnell? No. Uh, God made the promise He's going to have a new covenant with His people. Well, why? Why do you need a new covenant? You've got a covenant that was made, that old covenant. Why not keep it? Yeah, your sins couldn't be forgiven under that. You couldn't be saved under that old covenant. And that's what He talked about. He says, but finding fault with them. Now, the fault with the, with the old covenant was not that God somehow or another messed up and didn't do it right. It's simply that covenant uh, could not provide salvation. And, and I think there's a reason why God gave that covenant. 
that it needs to be impressed upon mankind. We can't save ourselves. We can't do enough good in life to save ourselves. Uh, and so, you know, that law is evidence of it. If you could be saved by that law, then you could be saved without having your sins forgiven. Uh, you know, you, you could merit salvation in some other way. Well, th there was no way that could be. So it, it, it was necessary uh, that Christ died in order that that law could be removed. Uh, second, also, he died to begin the New Testament, the New Covenant <clears throat> that we have. Matthew, uh, uh, first of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and verse 25. <coughs> While you turn to that, I mean, under the Old Covenant, uh, when that covenant was begun, it was ratified by the sprinkling of blood. Blood was sprinkled upon the covenant, upon that old law, and it was sprinkled upon the people uh, in order to, to uh, begin that old covenant, that covenant that God had with His people. Now look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. Jesus said, this cup, that's, what, what is the cup? The, the, yeah, it's, and it represents the blood of Christ that they're to drink. And so this cup, he says, is the covenant, uh, this new covenant in my blood. And so the new covenant is going to have to be uh, begun by the shedding of blood. Not the blood of animals, but it's the blood of Christ itself that makes possible the beginning of that new covenant that God has with us today. And so he, he had to die in order for that to happen. Uh, he, he died also to purchase the church. We talked about that in, in most recent lessons. That's the words that Paul gave to the church, uh, to the elders in the church at Ephesus in the book of Acts when he told them uh, to, to take heed to the flock of which God had made them overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So that was the price that was paid in order for the church to be brought into existence. In order for us to be a part of that church, we had to be forgiven of our sins. And to be forgiven of our sins, the blood of Christ needed to be shed. And so it was necessary for Christ to die uh, in, in order that uh, the church itself might be purchased. Uh, then he also died to be a propitiation for our sins. Uh, don't you love that word? Uh, what, what does the word propitiation mean? I think there are a couple of different uh, ways in which it's used in the Bible. Covering. Number one, it's used as a covering. It's the same word that's used of the, of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, that the covering of that. Uh, you, the same Greek word is used of that covering as is used for the word propitiation. And so just as that's the covering of the Ark, and so... The blood of Christ becomes the covering of our sins. It's the means that God has uh, for taking care of the sins that we have. Uh, and so he, he dies in order to be a propitiation for our sins. 1 John chapter 2. If someone turn over to that real quick. 1 John chapter 2, uh, he makes that clear uh, in verse 2. Who's the hour that he's talking about there? When John says he's a propitiation for our sins, who's that talking about? All of us, all who are Christians. He's a propitiation for our sins, but it's not for ours only. <coughs> it's also for the whole world. When Jesus died and his blood was shed, it was shed for everybody, so that everybody could be forgiven. Everybody could have their sins covered. Now, sometimes the problem is that we try to cover the sins ourselves. <clears throat> and if I can keep them hid from anybody else, uh, then we think that's okay. The only thing is it's not covered in God's eyes. God sees it. God knows about it. Uh, if it's going to be covered, it's got to be covered in the proper way. And the only way for covering it is through the blood of Christ. And so he's the covering for our sins, his blood being shed for us. Uh, but it's not just for us. It's for everybody. And then another reason, the last thing you were looking at here, that Jesus died to show us the love of God. Now, I think that would be, be something that's obviously 
uh, recognized by everybody, but a couple of passages. John 15, 13, we'll turn, someone turn to that and read it. The other is John 3, 16, we don't have to turn to that. Uh, probably everybody here could quote that uh, in, in regard to the love of God for us, had for us. But what about John 15 there? Who's got that? All right, go ahead, Brother Gilbert. Okay, greater love has no one than this. You can't find a greater love than this. And someone's willing to lay down their life for you. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Uh, he laid down his life for all of us. That was God's way of showing us how much he loves us. Uh, he would give his only son to die for us. Uh, in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The only begotten, uh, monogonates in the Greek, the only one of a kind. We're all sons of God, uh, you know, by faith in Christ Jesus, but we're different than Christ. Uh, Christ is literally God's Son. He was begotten of God, uh, not just when He brought Him into this world, but when He resurrects Him. Uh, but He is God in the flesh. We're not. But we're adopted into the family of God. And so, but God gave that only one of a kind, His own Son, Jesus, uh, to show His love for us. Yes, sir. Jerry? Okay, yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he said he's expected we lay down our life for our family, but he laid down his life for his friends. By the way, who are the friends of Christ? Sir? Those who do his will. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you do whatsoever I command you. And so when people are willing to listen to Christ and obey him, they're the ones who become his friends. Uh, and it's for them that uh, his life is laid down. That is, they're the ones that are going to benefit from it. Now, he died for everybody, but not everybody's going to benefit from his death because not everybody's been willing to obey him, uh, to listen to what he says and, and to heed him and do what he's told us to do. And so <clears throat> it's important for us to understand Christ died not because he couldn't save himself. He could have if he wanted to. And it's not because he's a sinner and deserved to be put to death, but it's for other reasons. And, and this one here is especially important to impress upon us, to show to us how much He really does love us and care for us. Now, as we consider His death on the cross, very briefly, uh, I just want to go over those seven sayings of the cross. We've talked about six of them in lessons I've given. I'm not going to go into all of that again, but just to remind us once again uh, of these seven things about it, the seven sayings of Christ on the cross because they all have important lessons to us. <coughs> uh, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. His prayer here. Not for his family, not for his friends, but for who? Yeah, the ones that are crucifying. Those who are his enemies. That's who he's praying for. Uh, there have been a lot of people who prayed for their enemies. You have even find examples in the Bible where people pray for their enemies. And usually when they pray for their enemies, what do they pray? Strike them dead. Strike them dead, you know. Uh, may they receive double for what they've done to me. You know, just not enough. I want God to punish them, but you, you treat them twice as bad as they've treated me. And that's usually how people pray in regard to their enemies. But the prayer of Christ for his enemies is he's praying for what's the very best for them. And what they needed more than anything, like any of us, is forgiveness of sins. And that's what he's praying for. Father, forgive them. And so uh, an extreme and a great lesson to us in how we ought to pray in life in regard for our enemies. Uh, number two, second one. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first was a prayer. This is the answer to a prayer. Uh, initially, both of those people crucified with Christ, those two thieves, both of them, initially had begun by, <clears throat> you know, uh, joining in with the, the mob of people around the cross uh, in, in their treatment of Christ. Uh, but this one evidently makes a change in his life. Uh, because he's the one that said to him, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. That's interesting. You know, uh, 
Uh, the other thief also had a prayer to Jesus. What, what did he pray for? You remember? Yeah, save yourself and us. So his prayer, you know, was that he wanted salvation from the crucifixion. You know, get us off this cross and save our lives. The second thief here doesn't pray for that. He's not concerned now about his physical life. In fact, he had rebuked the first thief, saying, you know, we're guilty. We deserve what we're getting, but this man's done nothing wrong. And so he's not asking to be reprieved from the physical death he's suffering as punishment for his sin. But what he is asking for is to be remembered uh, spiritually, to be saved spiritually for his soul. And so that's his, his prayer. And Jesus answers that prayer by telling him, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, so we can know that when the individual who's right with God, when he dies, uh, he'll be able to go to that place of paradise, uh, that place of comfort that's given to them. Uh, the third saying, Woman, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother. Uh, Richard talked about that again uh, in his lesson tonight, mentioning that. Uh, Christ is taking care of his mother. The responsibility he has as the oldest child, his, uh, her husband, uh, evidently at this time, is dead. Uh, we have no mention of, of Joseph at all during this period. Uh, and so he can't take care of Mary. Uh, he can't, Jesus can't depend upon his brothers to take care of because they don't believe in Jesus. And so he's looking for someone who, who's a believer of his that can't take care of her. And so he entrusts that, we believe, to John, the disciple that he loved. Uh, and the Bible says that John took her from that moment, took her to his own home. Some people believe that immediately after Jesus said that, that John left and took Mary with him so she would be spared the last moments of Jesus' life seeing that happen. Uh, but he takes her to his own home to take care of her. And so Jesus is speaking there in regard to his mother and the love that he has for her. The fourth one, we talked about uh, probably the most difficult thing for people to understand. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, <clears throat> I recall, you know, my oldest brother, who at best could have been de described as an agnostic, uh, brought that up to me one time. How do you explain that? Uh, you know, uh, Jesus admits that God's left him. He's not with him. Uh, e even if there is a God, he'd say, and, and he'd say, I can't prove there is or isn't, but if there's not a God, and, and but even if there is a God, then Jesus is admitting, you know, God's forsaken me. Uh, and so how do you explain that? And it becomes a difficult thing uh, for people to understand. But I think it, that he says this because he genuinely was forsaken. He's taken upon himself the sins of the world, and God, who cannot look upon sin, has turned away for that moment uh, because Christ has taken our sins upon him. Uh, I think I may have mentioned the lesson about this. Martin Luther uh, is the one who, in reading about this passage, took his Bible and threw it across the room and exclaimed, God forsaking God, who can understand it? Uh, and it's difficult. But I think understand what the Bible says. We know why, why God would have to turn his back on Christ at that time. Then, then the cry, I thirst. Again, showing the humanity of Jesus. Uh, he knew what it was like to thirst, but, but the thirst he has here is, is much worse than just a uh, desire for a drink of water after working out in the sun all day. Uh, <clears throat> I've read different accounts. People talk about the battlefields of soldiers that are wounded out on the battlefields uh, that, that left there, you know, for, for hour after hour. That, that the one thing they said that is most painful to them is not whatever wounds they have suffered, but it's that need for a drink, for, for, for a water uh, of the least little amount uh, that they're crying out. That that's the thing that's causing them the greatest agony and the greatest pain. And so Christ is suffering that. But as we mentioned when we preached the lesson on it, that, that I think also here Christ is showing his confidence that men can change, that they can care about him. And even those people rebelling against him, that somebody in that crowd could care enough to give him something to drink, and someone did. Then it is finished. Again, talked about that at length, uh, of what all ended. Not only ending of the law, uh, ending of his work that God had given him to do, uh, completing it even by uh, his death here on the cross, it's finished. Uh, but the last one, haven't talked about this in the sermon, but 
We have mentioned a little bit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Two things about this passage. Number one, it's a quotation from the Old Testament, from the book of Psalms. <clears throat> and so, again, when you think about Jesus and his life, uh, if you look at the New Testament and all the words that Jesus spoke, approximately 10% of the things that he said are quotations from the Old Testament. Jesus trusted in God's Word, and he used it all of his life uh, to support himself in life. And so even as he's dying, the last words that he offers from the cross is a quotation from the Bible. That's just, he's always relied upon the Bible, and so here in death, he relies upon it. But more than just that, it's also a prayer. This is a prayer that most Jewish parents taught their children from a young age. Uh, many of you probably, like myself, I remember as a child being taught a simple prayer, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And that's what the Jewish parents were teaching their children. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. So it's entrusting God to take care of his spirit. A simple child's prayer. But throughout his life, he's prayed, trusting in God, and he does so here in his day. One other thing about it, and we'll close out. He adds one word to that Old Testament quote. And that one word he adds is the word Father. When the Jews prayed to God, they usually prayed, O oh God, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. O oh Father, the Father, rather, the O oh the Father of our Father. But Jesus taught his disciples, when you pray, you pray, our Father. We're not praying to the God of our fathers. We're praying to our God, to our Father. We have that relationship with him. And so Jesus acknowledges that here in his death, uh, that he's trusting in his Father to take care of his spirit. Okay, our, our time is, well, we've still got a minute or two, but everybody else has left. So uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed at this time. Father, again, we thank Thee for all that You do for us in life. But, Father, help us to understand and appreciate the greatest sacrifice that has ever been made in life. It's a sacrifice You made when You gave Your Son to die for us and when Jesus willingly gave His life that we might be brought back again unto Thee. We pray, Father, You'd be with us throughout this evening and throughout what life we have left. Keep us, Father, in Thy care and safety and help us like our Lord, to trust in Thee, that even to the moment of our death, that we will commend our spirit unto Thy care and keeping. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.